Unit 15, Part 3. Okay, what about existential generalization? We've been through these two rules and deriving from their names uh, what they allow us to do, according to the preliminary statement of them, we determined that uh, this one is not going to require any restrictions on its use because it will never lead us astray, while this one will require will require restrictions on its use, existential instantiation will, because clearly it will lead us astray if we do not restrict its use. It will be an invalid rule, leading us from things that are true to not true, if we don't restrict its use, right? Because I am not entitled to infer from the fact that someone trampled my strawberry patch that you, the particular individual that you are, trampled my strawberry patch. That would not be fair and that would, be, would not be a valid inference. So let's, again, deduce from the name of the rule what existential generalization allows us to infer and see whether this rule requires restrictions. We should many times derive from the name of these rules what they allow you to do as per these preliminary statements until you get it. Right, let's do it again and again. Existential generalization, okay. Existential, so the existential quantifier is involved. It's instantiation or generalization? It's generalization, so I'm going to generalizing, I'm adding the existential quantifier. So this rule allows me to go from um, this particular individual, A, Andrew, is F, to there exists some X such that X is F. Uh, will this always be valid? Will this always be truth preserving? Or do I require, um, will, will it possibly lead me astray? Will this rule possibly lead me astray? No, this is clearly a universally valid rule. No restrictions necessary, right? What does it say? If you're given as true that some propositional function is true of this particular individual, you are definitely entitled to infer that the propositional that there exists some x for which the propositional function is true. Right? The conclusion is analytic of the premise. Right? So um, this is an easy rule. No restrictions on this rule are required. <coughs> okay, this one's easy. What about universal generalization? Again, what does this rule allow us to derive according to its name? Um, it does in fact allow us to infer from uh, a particular instance, the propositional function here, fx, is true of a particular individual here, a for Andrew, right? So I'm go I'm, the rule allows me to infer from that, the, from the propositional function being true of a particular individual to this propositional function being true of all beings. Right? That is what this rule will allow us to do. Right? We have to restrict it, but that's what it will allow us to do. It allows us to go from um, the propositional function true, being true of some individual, right? because it's universal generalization. It's universal, therefore I'm, therefore I'm either going to or coming from the universal quantifier. It's generalization, thus I'm going to the universal quantifier. So I'm going from an instance to a universal statement. I am going from the propositional function being true of an instance to it being true of all things. That is the rule of universal generalization. Quite clearly, this will require some quite heavy restrictions. Right? We need to restrict the use of this rule. This is a hard rule. It's hard. What does it mean to be easy and hard? A rule is easy if it's uh, clearly valid in all circumstances and no restrictions on its use are required. Um, it's easy, these rules are easy because the preliminary statement of what the rule allows you to do is the complete description of the rule, right? Nothing <coughs> more needs to be added. It's only really the hard rules, EI and UG, um, for which these preliminary descriptions are preliminary restrict their use. Um, uh, but yes, these, these easy rules, they're easy. We don't need to restrict their use at all. Um, uh, but these ones are hard. Um, let me sort of say something uh, about these two hard rules, um, existential instantiation, universal generalization, where we're going now is we're going to um, elaborate on why the restrictions are needed and then 
specify what those restrictions on the use of these rules are. But for now, while we've got the easy and hard on the board, um, these two rules are easy, these ones are hard, but one's harder than the other. <laughs> um, existential instantiation, I'm gonna call the easy hard rule. This is the easy hard rule. It's a hard rule, but it's the easy hard rule. Whereas UG is the hard hard rule. <coughs> difference between the easy hard rule and the hard hard rule um, will cover the different uses of this rule, the different way we make restrictions on the rule. Um, EI will be easy hard because um, in the only thing that needs to be added to the preliminary statement of the rule, which is what it is, if you're given a premise of this form, you're entitled to infer, if you're given a formula of this form, you are entitled to take that as a premise and infer a formula of this form. right? And this is the easy hard rule because the only addition is when you write this as the justification EI, you will also write flag A, right? You just have to write that as part of the justification, flag A, and be aware that you are flagging the letter to which you're instantiating and follow the restrictions on flag letters. There will be there are three flagging rules, those are rules governing the um, use of flag letters, and only two of them you need to know for really um, this before the third exam. The third rule only applies to the Unit 18 stuff, which is for the Top Gun class, which is going to take the fourth exam, which you only take if you're going for an A. Um, so the two rules you need to know are the, well, the flag letter, the letter flagged, in this case A, needs to be new to the proof. Secondly, that flag letter cannot appear amongst the premises or conclusion. Those are just a statement of the rules. But before we get there, let's uh, look at why, get clearer on why we need restrictions. So here is an example of an invalid proof, right? This is um, from page 278, so section four of Clank. Um, it's an invalid proof, and this is a proof that we, we would be allowed to make with the use of existential instantiation if existential instantiation was left unrestricted. Okay? Um, and I also want to highlight this line from Clank on 278, in the very first paragraph, the opening paragraph of section 4, which introduces you, which elaborates on these rules of universal instantiation and universal generalization. Right? So this is an elaboration on the hard rules and telling you um, what you need to do to be careful with them and use them properly. So here's the line. The rules of EI and UG must be rather heavily restricted and it will be easier to learn these restrictions if you can see why they are needed. And that's what this is for, first of all, to show you why we need to restrict the use of EI. Um, this sentence is the one I wanted to read. The point is really very simple. Without the restrictions, the rules are not valid. Used indiscriminately, they would lead to logical errors or invalid inferences. Right? So that's, that's what we thought through when we thought our way to which of these rules required restricting. Right? We, th we thought our way for existential instantiation. Right? Somebody trampled my strawberry patch, therefore you trampled my strawberry patch. We realized that was not valid, right? <laughs> so the rule needs restrictions to preserve validity. We don't want to introduce non-valid rules into our logical system, because then we wouldn't be doing logic anymore. OK, so um, here is an example, as I say, of a proof. I mentioned it in Unit 14 lectures. Um, a proof which we would, we would be able to make if we didn't restrict the use of existential instantiation that we don't want to be able to make, because <laughs> this is an invalid inference. Uh, these two are premises, sorry. These two are going to be premises. Uh, these are going to be deductions, and it's going to be the conclusion. Um, this is a proof which leads us from true premises to a false conclusion in real life, in the real world. In the real world, the premises are true, the conclusion is false. OK, what, what, it, what is this? OX, X is an odd number, N, sorry. O x x is odd. N x is x is a number. E x x is even. Those are definitions. E x equals x is even. 
Okay, so the two premises are there are odd numbers and there are even numbers. There exists an x which is both odd and a number, and there exists an x which is both even and a number. Right, those are two true premises. Of course, they are only true because the numbers referred to are different numbers. Right? But what's the conclusion? The conclusion is there exists an x such that x, uh, sorry, that should be x. Okay. Um, there exists an x such that x is odd and even and number. Right? This says there is some one number, there is at least one number which is odd and even, which is false. True premises, there are odd numbers, there are, uh, there are even numbers. False conclusion, there are numbers which are both odd and even. Okay, um, so, we don't, so we don't want to make that inference. So when you're reading through this, I want right, to be clear on the point of Clay's discussion here on 278. This is to show you um, what we want to block. Right? She introduces it with the line that I read. The rules of EI and UG must be rather heavily restricted. It'll be, it will be easier to learn these restrictions if you can see why they're needed. So please see this as showing you why the restrictions are needed. We don't want to be able to do this. If we didn't restrict EI, see how we would be able to derive this false conclusion from these true premises. Step three, right? I'm inferring, so step three and four, apply the unrestricted rule of existential instantiation, right? Um, uh, step three, I'm EIing from one, I'm, I'm instantiating from one, right? What have I done? Instantiating, deleted the quantifier and replaced the variable with the same individual constant A, right? Step four, I'm in existentially instantiating from two, right? I'm inferring that since there are even numbers, then, uh, since there are even numbers, a is an even number, right? And the, the crucial thing to notice, the whole punchline, is, oh look, I've instantiated to the same individual, right? So given that, what do I do? I simplify, this is a conjunction now. Um, a is both odd and a number, that's what this says. So A is odd. Um, in step four, I inferred that A is an even number. A is even and even number. So to that, I combine what I've simplified here. So now I have that A, right, I'm already onto very false things, the particular number referred to by the individual constant A is both odd and even and a number. And from that, I existentially generalize, right, from that instance, to this generalization. Notice here um, how generalization is the opposite of instantiation. Because when you're working backwards, you're going to be doing, you're going to be thinking of instantiating to figure out when you're working backwards in proofs to figure out exactly what instance you need to derive to be able to generalize to use the generalization rule to get the formula the, the quantified formula that you're tasked with proving more on that when you do a look at proofs okay but just the mistake here is in so this is to show you that a restriction is needed the restriction we want is to prevent um, this instantiation being to the same letter that we instantiated to here, right? We don't want this, so A refers to some individual number, in this case, or some individual which is, which is a number. We're saying this one individual is an odd number and an even number. We don't want that to be allowed, right? Um, so we need a flagging restriction.